And so the last question, number 16 from the 2009 advanced tyre. So three parts here. First part, use Gaussian elimination to solve that system of equations. Five marks, not too bad. As long as you don't fall foul of all the micro arithmetic that you know is going to take place here. Now, first of all, let's get batter out the matrix of all the coefficients, the augmented matrix. So it's one, one, negative one, 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 negative one, and this part was six, there's the augmented parts. Two, negative three, two, two, negative five, two, negative four, one. And the object is to reduce that into upper triangular form. In other words, I want these three things replaced by zeros, those three elements. Doesn't matter about the rest of them. And you just take, only take two steps to get there. First step will be get both of them into zero, so you're going to leave the top alone. So how can you make that into zero? Well, if you take away two of row one, so I'll do that. Row two, take away two of row one, and then it's just as well, you just have to be careful. You do all the bits properly, same, carefully. Two, take away two, obviously with zero, because that was the whole intention. Negative three, take away two, negative five. Two, take away, negative two will be four. 2 take away 12 will be negative 10. How can you make that a 0? Well, add on 5 of them. If you do row 3 and add on 3 lots, sorry, 5 lots of row 1, then that should go to 0. We'll get that wrong. Just be careful with the rest. So it's 2 plus 5 makes 7. It's negative 4 plus a negative 5 makes a negative 9. And it's going to be 1 plus 30 is 31. So really take these three lines. And then finally, make that into zero. And then it's in the upper triangular form. Because you'll have Z on its own. Then just Z with the Y, so you can find Y. And then the Z with the Y with the X, so you can find X. So those ones are going to stay alone, stay the way they are. There's no need to reduce it anymore. You can just back substitute, the way I said. So how can I get that to be a zero? Well, you could combine it. There's no point combining it with the top row because, of course, that's going to bring that one back into play. You have to use these two rows now. So, unfortunately, that's quite a big bit I'll have to do here. I'd have to do five of row three and add on seven of row two, unfortunately. That would make that into zero, so just be careful with your arithmetic. So, I've got negative 45 plus 28, which is negative 17. And then I've got five times that, some seven of them. So I've got five times that, 155. 155 and a negative 70. 155 take away 70, 85. And then it's ready to go, just read it from the bottom up. So what have I got from this? I've got negative 17z was 85. Hopefully that'll work out nicely. That would have to be in that case, that's five times it. So it must be z's negative 5. Now you know that's the case, I can go to the next line. Negative 5 plus 4 z's, just put the negative 5 in straight away, sorry, is negative 10. So negative 5y, that's negative 20, that'll go across as a 10, means y is going to be negative 2. Now I know both of those, I can get to x, I've got x plus a y, so that's just negative 2, Minus a z, which is a negative 5, should come to 6. So I've got x equals, and then just take those parts over. You've got negative 2 plus 5, so that's a 3. Take that away, 3. Final answer, if you want to put it in the solution form. 3 for x, negative 2 for y, negative 5 for z, and there you are, 5 marks. Those are the individual parts, and there that's the final answer. Part B. Show that the line of intersection of these two planes is given by these parametric equations. Now, the first thing you notice is those two planes are just the first two lines in that Gaussian elimination. And there's only two marks for this. And it gives the result. So one possibility for this would just be to prove that, that they actually work for both equations. That would justify it just being two marks. Simply saying that, we'll take these two, call that plane 1 and plane 2, just using pi for p for plane, then if those fit them both, then that must be the case. So you could just do it by substitution. Take plane 1. So pi 1, what have I got? I've got x, so that's lambda, plus y, 
that's 4 lambda minus 14, minus z, which is 5 lambda minus 20. What's that all together? So I've got lambda and 4 lambda minus 5 lambda, and I've got minus 14 and plus a 20. So that part comes to 0, that part comes to 6, which is correct. That equals, whoops, which equals the right-hand side. So it works for that plane. 2. Does it fit this plane? Well, if it does fit that plane, then this whole thing should come to 2. What's x? x is lambda minus 3 times what's y? 4 lambda minus 14 plus 2z. So that's 5 lambda minus 20. What does that lot come to? So I've got 2 lambda minus 12 lambda plus 30, 42 plus 10 lambda minus 40. Well, 12 take away 12, they've gone. 42 take away 40 is 2, which does equal the other side. So that's correct, which means the line does fit. So L, that was the line, L, L is the intersection of pi 1 and pi 2. Now that should do. Still quite a lot of work there, just for the two marks. But I don't like these wee parts. Now, if you thought that was maybe cheating a wee bit just by proving that the result worked, because after all, I think you could just do that, but you're used to working it out. What if the question had said, derive that that was the result, but it didn't actually say derive, it just said show that though that is the line of intersection. Then you would start to think, well, that must have something to do with that original Gaussian elimination. So for an alternative to just showing that the result works, if you wanted to derive that from the start, well, the two ways you'd be doing either algebraically, by solving that pair of simultaneous equations. Notice there's three variables, two equations, so one of them floats. So you would solve them just by eliminating something convenient. I wouldn't eliminate the x. I would eliminate the z, for instance, or eliminate the y to leave just x in one of the others because it wants x to equal just the parameter on its own, whereas usually it would be z. So you could do that. You could combine them to remove either y or z, and then you can substitute that in. Or there must be, it's only two marks, it must be something to do with that original one, because you shouldn't have to do this from scratch. That original Gaussian elimination had those two as your top line. And if you go back to your Gaussian elimination to the way that it ended up, it was like this, where I've not bothered with the bottom line because you only had the first two, so I've got redundancy. And then you would say, right, now, the way that that's actually arranged would be perfect for either making z into lambda or the y into the lambda and then back feeding it, but I actually want the x to be the one. So I'd have to do one more step here. So since it's only two marks, this shouldn't take too long doing it this way rather than starting afresh with the algebra. So I want to leave x as one of the two remaining ones, not y and z which case I'll knock out one of them, so I'll knock out the Z's. If I knock out the Z's, then I would do this. I'd have 4 of row 1 and add on row 2. So I've got 4 of row 1, add on that, so that's a 4. 4 of that, add on negative 5, that's a 1. 4 of that, that obviously makes a 0. 24, take away 10, 14, and of course I'm leaving this alone. That would be the amendment to the Gaussian elimination that should give you this result. And then I can say, right, now I'll do this. I'll let x have the parameter to itself, so it's in the neat form. Then the top row says, I've got four x's, so that's four lambda. Take away a y, that makes 14. So taking the y over into backwards, y is going to be four lambda minus 14. That wasn't too long. Going to the next row, what have I got? I've got negative five times y, oh, that's a bit big, four lambda minus 14, plus four z equals negative 10. Then I've got... 4z equals, bring it all over, that's negative 20 lambda, so it goes across as 20 lambda. That's going to be positive 70, so it's going to go across as negative 70, making that altogether negative 80. Then divide by 4, z equals 5 lambda minus 20. There, that would give you the parametric equations of the line of intersection of the two planes. Then for part C, find the acute angle between this line, L, and this plane, which of course was the third of the equations in the Gaussian. Not that that helps at all in this particular case. So what have you got then? So you want the angle between this line and this plane. So what have you got? Just as a quick sketch. You've got this plane, and you've got this line, 
which cuts through it. The angle between the line and the plane means the angle of the line projected between the line and its projection onto the plane. But what you'll do instead is find the angle between the line and the normal to the plane. This angle in here. And then just take it away from 90. Or use that device of the sine instead of cosine. So I need the direction of the line and the direction of the normal to the plane. Well, the normal to the plane is easy enough. I'll just call that N. The normal to the plane will just be negative 5 to negative 4. Or if you wish, you could reverse that and call it 5, 2, because it's the same both ways around. But I'll just leave it that way. The direction of the line. Well, to get the direction of the line, the numbers are actually staring at you there. I'll have to rub this out just now. Because if I put that back from the parametric form into the original vector form, which would have been this, then I'd have lambda times, and that's 1, 4, 5, and then plus, I suppose, and I'd have 0, negative 14, negative 20. Meaning there's a point in the line, there's the direction vector of the line, and to get to any point in the line, it's just a case of taking however many steps of this away from that, and that will take you to any point. So that's the vector equation. But importantly, that's the direction vector. So I've got that. So I've got n equals that, and I'll just call it v. And the direction vector of the line is 1, 4, 5. I want the angle between those two vectors, scalar product. So I'll take the scalar product of them. So to get the cosine of the angle, I don't know what I called it before, just call it that, that'll be n dot v over the length of n times the length of v. So that's just like you did in the higher. Remember, this is going to give you the angle, though, between the line, the line and the normal. You'll have to take it away from 90. Or just change that into sine, because the sine gives the complement. So I've got n dot v, so it's multiplying the tops together. I'll have to set it out. Negative 5 times 1, plus 2 times 4, and ooh, plus negative 4 times 5 over the length of that one. I'll just call it 5 squared, 2 squared, 4 squared, because the squaring doesn't really consider the negatives. 1 squared, 4 squared, 5 squared. So altogether that's going to be negative 5 plus 8 minus 20 over the square root of 25 plus 4 plus 16, 1 plus 16 plus 25. So that's going to be <coughs> that's 3, that's negative 17 over square root of 42. Two, yes, and I've gone cross-eyed and put the second one down first. So square root of 45. So that angle is going to be the inverse cos. Or oh, you could go straight with inverse sine and that'll be your answer. Inverse cos of that, negative 17 over root 42 times 45, which is 113.01. O19, etc. So, noticing that that's an obtuse angle, so obviously those vectors are radiating in opposite directions. They might have been better off using the reverse of that, because that obviously means whatever the plane is, if V's heading that way, this normal is actually down underneath, so I've got an obtuse angle. But nevertheless, you just take 90 away from it to find the actual angle you want. So, the angle itself is going to be 113.02 well, minus 90 which gives me 23.02 or even just 23.0. There.